Hello, I think we're live now. Uh, and um, just to say, I'm Cliff Pry, I'm CEO of the Global Steering Group on Impact Investment, a 33 country movement improving the lives and planet by innovating and advancing impact economies. I'd like to be your moderator today on this cycle topic of solutions for an impact led economy. Um, I now I was going to um, uh, uh, to uh, tell you a little bit about um, my co-panelists, but there's some technological difficulty in getting two of them through. So I'll ask, first of all, the two panelists that we have here to tell a little bit about um, themselves, to introduce themselves. So first of all, Laurie. Hi, Cliff. Hello, everyone. Delighted to be here. I'm Laurie Spengler. I'm an impact investment banker, which means that I spend the bulk of my professional efforts structuring investable transactions on behalf of the issuers. And that means the folks who are going to use the capital, whether they be operating entities or asset managers and bringing those investable transactions to market. I've been doing this for quite some time. Uh, and in addition to my day job, if you will, I'm very active in the field building efforts of the broader impact investing community through the Global Steering Group on Impact Investing, the UK Impact Investing Institute. And I'm also on the board of CDC, which is the UK Development Finance Institution. Fantastic. Thank you. Dolika. Thank you so much, Cliff. And uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Dolika Banda. I am, uh, as Laurie is, a member of the board of CDC. And I am also a member of a Pan-African Infrastructure Fund in uh, based out of South Africa called Harris. I, uh, my background is DFIs largely, spent many years with the IFC, spent a few years with CDC. I have sat on the boards of financial sector deepening, so the whole concept of financial inclusion, um, whether it's youth or gender related issues of, of, of deep concern to me. And it's a pleasure to be here to speak about the impact that COVID has had, but also the opportunity that COVID will present for us. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And Amit, delighted that you managed to fight your way through the technology. Thanks. I'm glad to be here with all of you. And uh, my uh, name is Amit Bori. I'm the CEO of the Global Impact Investing Network. Uh, as your name would suggest, uh, we're a network of impact investors from around the world, um, some from the development finance community, many from um, philanthropy, and also even more from the mainstream financial, financial institutions uh, that are all trying to put capital to work to have a positive impact on the world. Um, we support a global network that includes over 30,000 people around the world, um, over 300 formal member organizations uh, based in 50 countries uh, across six continents. Um, this is an incredibly important topic, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, about it with all of you. Thank you. Thanks very much. And, um, we are hoping to also have uh, with us Nick Hurd, um, formerly the civil society minister for uh, at, at, uh, at the UK, um, uh, who was also very in influential in the creation of um, the Big Society Capital, the world's first wholesale impact investor, which I had the great privilege to be the CEO of. So uh, thanks to the panel. Um, uh, we'll hopefully get Nick uh, shortly. Um, so look, the, it, it's it's a pretty obvious statement. Um, the global impact of COVID-19 has been enormous already. Doesn't look like it's going anywhere at the moment in health, in economies, in livelihoods, in geopolitics, um, but even in this uh, worst of adversity, there is some opportunity to build a better future. Um, firms and institutions globally may be being furloughed for their staff or, or even, even losing their way, but some are seizing the moment to realign, realign profit with social and environmental impact and greater sustainability. So. Who is going to lead a global regeneration based on ESG and impact investing principles? What are the best ideas and actions to begin with? How can they be globally integrated? Just a, a brief word about the word impact for any participants who may not be familiar to this world. And I'm going to uh, borrow one of uh, Amit's uh, statements on, on this from the gym. Impact investing is an exciting, rapidly growing industry powered by investors who are determined to generate social and environmental impact as well as financial returns. It's taking place all, all over the world 
across all asset classes. And of course, every investment, every corporate decision, every government decision has impact, whether it's for good or for harm, often a mix of the both. It's by measuring and managing our impact that we can work better and achieve greater benefit and less harm. So um, in this panel, we're going to uh, engage our panelists on, on the challenges that they see uh, in this crisis. We'll then move on to the ideas and actions that they see as most useful. And finally, how do we get there? We'll keep our contribution short and to the point uh, so that we can try and get some Q&A time um, and you can put your questions and points in the uh, in the chat box there and we'll take a look at those later on. So first of all, I'd like to uh, ask each panelist to describe how they see the situation in the crisis and perhaps one hope for the recovery. Um, and Dolika, could I start with you? Yes, thank you so much, Cliff. Um, and I like to think about this in two, in two separate uh, sessions. So there is a pre-COVID challenges. I think my focus is very much emerging markets and certainly very, very focused on Africa. Um, so I look at this as two steps. The pre-COVID challenges, which are the usual societal exclusion items, gender, finance, economics, social, governance. These are issues that existed before COVID, financial stress on our national fiscus. But I think what COVID has done is to bring to the fore, front and center for all of us, the importance of dealing with these inequalities. And so for me, I look at post-COVID opportunity. And I look at that opportunity as COVID having highlighted for us the importance of the global inter integratedness and cross responsibilities that we have, one for each other, so, and the whole concept of thinking globally in terms of the impact of what we do has on the rest of the world, but acting locally in terms of what solutions can be available at local communities and, and nationally. Um, and I think it has forced us also to focus on the importance of good leadership long-term thinking visionary leadership. What I have seen out of this and what I'd like to see as the opportunity is that COVID has actually brought out the, the power of local businesses. So we have lost some businesses, unfortunately, but the surviving ones have been forced to think differently, to prepare for the unexpected, and to also think risk management and risk mitigation. The evident vulnerabilities have also interestingly brought in my world a new focus on resilience to other risks, such as climate risk, disaster risk finance, safeguarding, gender-based violence, bringing women into the stems, thinking about the future generations. But it has also brought a sense of pride to emerging markets, whilst there has been despair and there has been worry. In many countries in Africa, I have seen people saying, wow, we're taking responsibility to create our own solutions. But all of that with caution and trepidation because we still do not know when this will be over. Neither do we know the full extent of the impact of COVID-19. So we must keep the eye on the ball. As they say, it ain't over till it's over. So I think the fight has to continue. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you. Thank you. That's really powerful. Amit. Well, I, I think a, a lot of what Dalika said really resonates with me. And, and I think just the things I'd add to it, because I think it was, it was a very comprehensive response to open this discussion. Um, I think you know, one of the ways I, that I think it's important to think about this is to actually recognize that there are multiple crises at play. Um, you know, there is, of course, a public health crisis with the actual, um, you know, the virus and, and the pandemic it's caused, which has stemmed a, um, an economic and financial crisis. Um, it's also in some parts of the world, like the U.S., um, like help to elevate a racial justice crisis. Um, and then I think um, we're also seeing that the kind of interrelationship with the climate crisis and, and not, not to add more, you know, too much of um, uh, you know, doom and gloom to the conversation. But it, I think this is also spurring a, a crisis in, in confidence and trust. Um, and all of these are mixing ways that we don't fully understand. And I think it's hard to overstate the uh, negative impacts of this crisis on, on society. But I do think my, my hope is um, 
is to really that it will drive us to make the changes that we have needed to make to address some of these like structural issues that predate the pandemic itself. Um, and, and I think that um, what I, I'm serving already is a, a shift in thinking that I think is really important. So we, we revisit the relationship we have between the private sector, uh, governments, um, and the civil sector and you know, the general public. Um, and, and I think you know, one specific way just to highlight that, to make that very tangible, the way that we view work in this environment is shifting dramatically. Um, there are many people who had jobs, um, but were still incredibly vulnerable and fragile um, and lack the security you would expect for someone who works hard and is well employed by our traditional measures. Um, so shifting the way we think about work from quantity to quality of work. Um, I think is an important shift so we better understand a more comprehensive way of what it takes to build a stable and resilient society that can withstand um, public health shocks, but the variety of other shocks and disruptions that we expect to see in, in the coming years. Thank you, Amit. And, and I'll come to you now, Laurie. Super. Thanks, Cliff. And I fully agree with the framing and the points that Dolika and Amit have made, specifically the structural challenges and issues that they both have highlighted globally and uh, specifically in emerging market economies, but they are global challenges and really embrace those. I, I'm going to put my comment specifically on development finance, uh, which is kind of a, a maybe a targeted, a potentially targeted community of, of actors with interventions operating in the context that Dolika and Amit described. And what I mean by development finance are really institutions, primarily financial institutions, whose mandate or mission has development at the center of what they're about. So they were set up as institutions to be thinking about development. So as Dolika says, they were thinking about development challenges pre-COVID, and certainly they're thinking about those challenges in the context of COVID and what comes next. And they, they think about them through the lens of livelihoods, poverty, climate change, jobs, uh, a number of different dimensions. There are several categories of these types of players. One would be organizations that are owned by many governments. We call them multilateral uh, finance institutions. The IFC would be one of those, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the Inter-American Development Bank, the African Development Bank. They have many governments who are shareholders in that institution. There are then institutions that are owned by a single government. So the Dutch own FMO as their development finance institution, the French have Proparco, the British CDC, the Americans Development Finance Corporation, DFC. And then there's also a constellation of non-government owned entities, community banks, community development banks that are not necessarily owned by government and are quite proximate, quite local, as Dolica was inviting, to community. And their mandate is about development. And so it's been interesting, I work very closely with this community, all three communities, and so what have we seen as some of the challenges to clip your opening comment? I would say a couple. First is that there's been a defensive initial reaction. It's quite understandable. These are organizations that have money already invested in community, in businesses, in other financial institutions. And so the initial notion was, let me take stock of my portfolio, of my investments. I must protect. That was the word. I must protect those institutions and those businesses I'm already invested in. As I say, very understandable. What we saw emerging out of that, though, once people got their arms around the portfolio, was a, a limited focus on additional liquidity for the system. And from my vantage point, I would say that's, that's a positive in the sense that if we don't maintain liquidity, some of the vulnerabilities we're seeing that are really liquidity driven will become solvency issues. So a liquidity challenge can cause a solvency issue for a business, even if the fundamentals of the business are still sound. And the longer that liquidity challenge continues, the greater the likelihood of the, the solvency challenge. Um, so these organizations, again, their mandate and mission is development finance focused on liquidity largely, which is, I think, a positive. But the, but the, 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 the scope of the intervention has been quite limited. And I think this is one of the challenges of navigating through COVID with the high degree of uncertainty. So partners, how do you actually distribute resources, financial resources to partners you don't know, you've never worked with before? How do you actually get your arms around the trust factor that Amit was saying, the underwriting challenges? 
So even if the intention or the desire is there, how do you actually do it in the current environment? So we've seen a real set of limitations and challenges there and also risk and risk perception. Uh, certainly the uncertainty has only increased the sense of risk. But how do we share that risk? How do we distribute that risk? How do we collectively take a piece of that risk? Because the pandemic is something that came upon us through no fault of anyone's, and it's something that we're all trying to deal with and address. And so how do we actually, as a society, if we are determined to be more resilient, how do we actually share that risk? So some of the, those are some of the challenges that we're seeing, even for institutions that have a very specific mandate. And I would just highlight it in the notion that as we look at the increasing amounts of capital, the announcements that are coming from people, so the quantum of capital in response to COVID, we can cite many of those and we should, we should encourage that. But what we really have to look at is the distribution of that capital. Where is it actually going? Because if capital was a constraint pre-COVID to a lot of the more vulnerable communities, the inequity point that Dolika spoke to, those pain points have only been exacerbated by COVID. So I think that the, the challenge has to be not just to look at the volume or the quantum of capital, but the distribution of that capital. And I think you're going to tease out some of the ideas, Cliff, in the next part of the conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. So um, pre-COVID, there was already a problem. Where's the money going? It's even more of a problem now. And there are some genuine reasons for that, but also perhaps some um, mm, uh, perhaps some courage could have could have helped. Let's, let's put it that way. Com both communities being important, global challenges also being important. Um, the positives of entrepreneurialism, of the drive to make the change and resilience coming through, the importance of resilience and what we're learning about resilience. Uh, unfortunately, Nick Hurd is still still stuck, but I know from uh, his his government experience, um, you know, from a government's perspective at the moment, this is terrifying. It's a terrifying binary choice. Do we go health care or do we go economic? Um, which 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 way do we go? Either either way, we're going to get hit. Um, huge levels of indebtedness that hasn't been seen since a major global war and the potential if this drags on for civil unrest uh that la loss, loss of trust that uh, that amit was was talking about to, to, uh, turning into into unrest so some really major major challenges so that's the that's the the tough stuff let's let's have a look at what we see as the uh, as the solutions, and perhaps um, we'll go in in re reverse order. So the best ideas, the best actions that you've seen, Laurie. Sure, thanks, Cliff. I mean, a couple again, sticking within the development finance community that I highlighted in my in my opening comments. Uh, a couple of things. One is we are seeing because of the scale of what's needed, um, and and one of the CEOs of of a, of a well known development finance institution said, we've got to keep it simple, we've got to scale, and we've got to do it fast. So three S's: speed, simplicity, scale, are his KPIs, which I which I, I like very much. Um, and so what I've seen as some bright spots: sector level or thematic level aggregating initiatives. What do I mean by that? It, because the need is so great, and we don't have all this all, all this time, but we do have a lot of local infrastructure that Dalika spoke to. So we can be creating aggregated vehicles around either a sector or a theme. So, for example, microfinance liquidity facility. And then as an aggregated facility in COVID liquidity, make that money available to a constellation of microfinance entities with similar underwriting procedures so that it can go quickly. Similarly, we've seen an initiative in the off-grid solar home system uh, sector, which I think has some, some also parallels for efficiency. Uh, we've seen it around small and growing businesses. So I think there's some very helpful thinking around aggregating liquidity facilities with a sector theme or a segment theme or a geographic theme. So that's one. The second is that I think there has been some progress where we've made specific allocations. This goes a little bit to my point about the risk sharing. So within your own portfolio, could you dial up? part of your allocation to entities that actually have more of a severe crunch on liquidity. So if we look at community development, financial institutions, a number of the corporates in the United States have actually put deposits with those community banks in local environments, which is terrific. 
But the real opportunity is for them to take those deposits and make part of that allocation into equity, because what those banks really need is additional equity to be able to make more loans available in the real economy in the local community. So not change all of what you're doing into equity, because from your risk appetite, that's not going to work. But if you're already committed to community banking in a certain area, could you not expand your portfolio and not keep it only in safe deposits, but move a little bit more into debt and equity. So portfolio allocation as a tool, uh, and then similarly an allocation within your own deal. Let's say you've made an investment or a line of credit from a development finance institution to a local bank. Could you actually impose a use of proceeds covenant that part of those proceeds, X percent of those proceeds need to go to women-led businesses? need to go to rural businesses, need to go to places, that's my point about the destination of the capital, places that are so capital constrained, they don't have another alternative. There's nothing there. So that would be some of the things that that, um, that we're seeing, some of, some of the ideas that we're seeing. Thank you. Um, Amit. Well, I think the um, the question is a, a challenge because it's a you know systemic crisis requires a systemic response. So I will um, I'll pick out a couple of things to highlight that I think are, are really interesting to me. There, I'll, I'll try to be as complementary to Lori's comments as possible, uh, just to bring some other perspectives into the discussion. But w- one positive thing that I, I think has happened is that you know with with the nature of this crisis, um, clearly for everyone who wants a more sustainable, more inclusive, you know, more just society, um, you know. I think the world is starting to recognize that we actually have to invest differently to get that. Um, and, and I think many investors are now you know, coming to terms with the fact that they may have been thinking about environmental and social factors as a way of uh, um, you know, protecting themselves from risk, uh, which is a totally valid approach, but I think are now increasingly thinking about how they can have a positive impact through their investments. Um, now, this is not new to impact investors, and, and we all know this, um, but what's new about this moment is that we're seeing a lot more engagement um, from huge mainstream institutions, particularly um, like institutional investors. Um, so these are the clients that many of the financial services firms want to serve, um, but um, increasingly, just in the last, I'd say, even four weeks, we've seen a, a huge jump in inbound interest from senior executives trying to think about how they can have a measurable impact towards like impact goals that either they set or that are consistent with the sustainable development goals. Um, now this may seem like a, um, you know, a, a very technical thing, but I think it's a leading indicator of a big shift um, where you know, people are really starting to revisit the role of their capital um, in society um, and that it has a purpose beyond just achieving financial returns for the owners, um, but rather is you know, they're trying to take a results and kind of a measurement driven approach to thinking about the results they can drive for other stakeholders in the process. Um, and I think that is where like impact investors and development finance institutions as a type of impact investors have a lot to offer um, you know, to the broader economy. Like how do we actually think about setting objectives when it comes to having a positive impact? And then how do we manifest those objectives into the investment process? You know, how do we think about frameworks for allocating um, you know, different choices along these dimensions? And ultimately, how do we measure the results in a way that can feed back into the way we are, are developing our strategies? Um, so my hope is that you know, we, we've seen this um, you know, actually on quite a global basis you know, from institutional investors in North America, in various parts of Europe, um, in Australia, and, and also um, in, in Asia. And I think that is, I hope, um, something that becomes you know, the norm um, you know, and, and is really part of a new kind of recognition of you know, for the investment market, you know, impact has to be a dimension of how we think about success. Um, because I think what we've, you know, if what we learn the, the price we pay um, with a system that does have the types of vulnerabilities to economic inequality, to basic social security and, and stability, uh, and of course, the, the ongoing challenge of addressing um, you know, the climate crisis. Thank you. Systemic <laughs> challenge. Um, I'll move over to you. Yeah, and I mean, look, I think um, everything that Laurie and Amit have said resonates absolutely. But the one thing that I have seen on the ground, and I think this is as true for emerging markets as it is for any other market, is just how powerful enabling technology solutions have been embraced. Mm-hmm. 
They've been embraced in our homes, in our families. They've been embraced in business. They've been embraced in emergency response. So the health system, the, the, the awareness creation, the education, the fintech, people who before would not have been using their mobile phones as actively, including the elderly, um, are now getting more and more comfortable with using technology as the means to be able to continue with day-to-day -day life. And that actually means, uh, in a perverse way, but, but in a very positive way going forward, is that technology can now take its rightful place as an integrator of society as a means and a tool to in, an inclusive society, inclusive communities, because people have access that they didn't have before. Mm -hmm. From a health, even from a health perspective, what was a pharmacy before now becomes also a, a medical advisory light touch, initial reaction um, platform. Education, many children were out of school and we were worried and I continue to be worried about how many will still be left behind because they are not able to get back into that classroom environment um, and still are not in many, many cases. But at least you're seeing innovation where educational systems are now trying to make accessible even to the lowest levels um, of those who don't normally have access are actually looking for ways that they can provide online education, homeschooling with the support of parents and so on. So for me, the whole role that technology has been catapulted into playing as a platform and a tool for in, an inclusive society, financially, economically, socially, health-wise, education-wise, has been very, very exciting. And it's happening more than we, we are even aware as we sit in these rooms. It's happening at the very local level. I'm also very excited that, you know, for, for, for Africa, the concept of science, research, and development has become more topical. Mm -hmm. So very early in the day, we of, of the beginnings of COVID, Senegal was already looking at what could the solutions be. Senegal had already come up with a testing kit that was more easily usable, easily available, cheaper in the country. But at that time, in the early stages, as you will recall, testing kits were in rare, in rare, in rare supply. Uh, South Africa itself has been a part very strongly of the panel with the UN that has been working on solutions and looking for the vaccines and testing out um, the, 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 the new medicals that are out there. Madagascar, I think we all have been following the story of Madagascar. How do you take a natural product that's being used and try to make it into a scientifically acceptable uh, product that's been properly tested, is in proper dosages and can be administered according to international standard. So for, for me, sitting in Africa, but I think it's true for many emerging markets, we suddenly have got this inquisitiveness and curiosity, but in a useful way and a constructive way about the role of science. And it goes further. It has even become a conversation now about how many women have access to PhDs. There's a whole study being done now uh, to research and development. So there's been tentacles of reactions that have for me, given me a very um, uh, uh, looking at the, the the light at the end of the tunnel. But I think also it has put our governments and our leadership um, under strain, but under positive strain, because they have actually had to step out and be seen to be taking action. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the way that um, Africa has reacted to this, many of us had a doom story at the beginning of COVID for Africa. Really, we thought the numbers in Africa were going to be a, a, a global uh, disaster. Any death is a global disaster, but the numbers for Africa have actually been less than what we thought um, because they reacted very quickly. 
and they did what needed to be to, to be done. That was in the first phase. We don't know what happens in the second phase, but at least there was a clear sense of leadership, a clear sense of regional coordination and continent-wide coordination about how do we handle this. And then I think my last point that I like to make, I'm very passionate about the youth. Um, I think that in all this, the youth voice is becoming louder and louder. They are critical. They are asking us adults and holding us accountable for action, for education, for awareness, and for the fact that we are holding this global world in custody for the next generation. So the next generation, because they are vocal, because they have access to, to Twitter and Instagram and all these things, um, and sitting in South Africa, I can't help but mention the song called Jerusalem, which went completely viral. Um, but they are using these platforms in a way that the world and their voice is becoming much louder. And we are left with no choice but to listen to listen to what world we are creating for them. So for me, yes, we all agree COVID has been a real devastation, but, and we'll, as we said, we still don't know the actual um, uh, depth of the damage, but at the same time, it has given us a point of renewal and a new oh, platform yeah. uh, well, uh, for which to um, catapult our thinking. Solika, that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. And and you you mentioned technology and of course, Although we're, you know, we're crying out for the first vaccine. Um, if we do get a vaccine within a year, that is, that is, well, what is it usually? Seven to 10 years. Uh, it is extraordinary the pace of, of technology in medicine in all kinds of, well, here we are now. Technology does not always work. And I would, I'm delighted that Nick Hurd has fought through and managed to get get here. Nick, would you like to um, introduce yourself and, uh, and and background? And we're on this this question of, uh, you know, what what's the best that we've seen? What's the best ideas, actions that you've seen um, for an impact led recovery? Uh, Cliff, thank you so much. I'm so sorry to fellow panelists for being uh, so late, and very grateful to my wife for helping me get through the technological hurdles that uh, our, our hosts have uh, set us. So. Um, uh, what what has impressed me? So it was fascinating to hear the perspective from from Africa. My lens as a sort of former uh, government minister observing how governments are responding at the at, at the moment. I think most are still in crisis mode, um, whether that be a public health crisis or uh, an economic crisis around jobs and livelihoods. There's lots of talk about recovery, Cliff, as you know, and governments are getting plenty of advice on what recovery should look like. I, I just make two points. I think there's a positive. Uh, which was I just picked up in the last comments, which is I think COVID has, you know, like being an asteroid strike, it has completely disrupted our sense of what was politically possible. We are doing things, as you know, in the UK, which would have been unimaginable just six months ago in terms of what politicians are now able to do. And there are, you know, there are some boundaries and points of concern uh, on that in terms of check and balance. But it has opened eyes of, to what is possible. And I think been a big disruptor of inertia and business as usual, and therefore a huge opportunity for for renewal and the kind of system change we many of us want to to see towards, uh, as you say, an impact led recovery. Um, the more negative point is that COVID has also, uh, forgive my language, screwed the public finances, uh, uh, tax down, uh, costs up, unexpected costs up. So most governments are asking themselves. How do we get out of this uh, in terms of a trajectory of growth, a trajectory of fiscal credibility? And I think increasingly the question will be asked, you know, do we need to fund this through the public purse, through the taxpayer? Can we mobilise private capital to help us at scale get the social and environmental outcomes we want? What can we do to enable them? By the way, I think that will be an increasingly legitimate question the more taxpayers' money is spent effectively propping up the private sector, which is what we're seeing at the moment. At some point, there will be a reckoning and a serious conversation around what the joint approach is to the cover. And it will have to be joint because of the state of the public uh, balance sheet. But I think that's a great opportunity for those of us in the impact movement who desperately want to be part of the solution and want to work with governments to create the kind of environment 
to mobilize the private capital. You and I, that we all know, is poised to, to mobilize at, at scale now, given the pressures on the investment markets for on ESG and impact uh, and, uh, and the need to be seen to be a positive force driven by investors, consumers, employees. All these trends are very, very powerful, but it needs governments to, to, to wake up to their power with carrots and sticks to create the right enabling environment for that. I did say, ah, schoolboy error, didn't unmute, apologies. Um, so if, if anybody has po uh, points to make or, or questions to ask, please do put them into the chat, the comments box down, I think, at your bottom right of your screen. Uh, we would love to hear, hear your questions and points. Um, so we've, we've heard some of the challenges. We've heard some of the uh, great ideas and, and the... Yeah, this asteroids hit, uh, unleashing change, unleashing change, both both negative, but also new opportunities, technology, Africa stepping up, as, as we heard. Um, how do we how do we get the ideas, the actions that we've seen to a new systemic level? How do we how, how what, what channels um, can we can we use to to get influence? Um, what what what's what's the art of the possible here? Can I come to Amit first? Sure. Well, I think there's um you know one thing that's really important is that there's a, a whole host of technical solutions, and we've talked about some of those. Um, I also think it's important to spend at least a little bit of time on on the cultural solutions that we need, um, and it, it actually goes back to some of the things that um, Adalika said at the very beginning. Um, you know, one of the things that you know has allowed this pandemic to spread, of course, is our interconnectedness. Right. And, and so this has spread across borders and across oceans. And and I think that it's um, and it's also exposed our interdependence. Um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the, um, uh, you know, how, how several you know, countries in sub-Saharan Africa have actually fared better than expected. Um, some of our, I mean, it's interesting. Some of our members um, who are investing um, in that part of the world have said that some of their investments are having the companies they've invested in are having issues because of their supply chains linking to other parts of the world that are more so than what's happening in, in the local economies. And, and, and it's a very interesting kind of way of highlighting our interconnectedness and our interdependence. I think is to get to your um, question about like, how do we come out of this and what, what's going to take this needed, I think is leaning into that, the positive elements of the interconnectedness um, and recognizing that these systems are intertwined, um, you know, that um, a, a crisis in one place does have ripple effects in others. Um, and when we think about issues like, like um, you know, inequality and we think about poverty and we, uh, our issues around the climate crisis, um, you know, realize that, that, that these are things that we need to have an entire cultural shift globally about the way that you know, what we expect of governments and the roles that, the, that they play in kind of setting the rules and the boundaries for the way the market operates. And of course, that what we expect of companies and investors, um, that their job is to do more than just make more money for the owners of the companies, and, and but rather to think about you know, how they strengthen you know, the livelihoods of people, of communities, uh, of countries, and of course, the health of the planet. <laughs> Amit, if I can touch on, on, on one thing here, that, you know, that, that would be a great future. Um, you know, history, history tells us that uh, financiers like money. Mm -hmm. um, they like money a lot and more than anything. Um, what, 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 what systemic changes, what, what tricks or techniques or uh, whatever might, might lock in a new approach for investors that, that, that stayed looking at risk return and impact? Yeah. Well, I, I think there's some that will come from government around just like how the, the rules of the game are written. So issues like fiduciary duty um, and you know, what is, um, you know, which really sets the stage of like what successful investing looks like um, and, and writes the, you know, the rules of how it guides how investors operate. I think incorporating an environmental and social factors into fiduciary duty is, is one very concrete thing that will have a, I think, a ripple effect in, in terms of um, positive outcomes. But I also think in terms of the, the voice of individuals and um, as Nalika talked about the voice of youth, um, you know, big huge pools of capital are controlled by like pension funds. Um, but that is actually aggregated capital on behalf of individual people, you know, ordinary folks who have jobs and things like healthcare, or teaching or working for government. 
Um, and I think you know, people need to you know, recognize that their money plays a role in shaping the world that we live in. Uh, so pensioners should be asking their pension funds to be invested in a way that leaves a better future for their children uh, or, or even a better world for them to retire in, um, as opposed to just having the right level of savings. Um, and, and that's what I mean in terms of um, some examples of very concrete things that I think could, could drive a more systemic shift. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, a lot of nods there. And um, Nick, one of the things that I've observed is that many organizations, many networks and so on have, have put out asks to government. Government should do this. Government should do that. How does that play to a government that is besieged with worries? Um, what, what, what's, what, would be, what would be different if you know, organizations like, like my own, like, like, uh, those of all of us on, on this panel here were, were making some offers. You know, we can solve this problem for you. Well, I mean, as a former government minister, I can tell you it's, it's a much more productive conversation if you're sitting at the table with someone who says, I understand your problems and here is how I might be able to make a contribution as a solution rather than someone coming in just asking for money or asking, uh, asking for support with no understanding of the, of, 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 of your problem. So it has to be an offer and ask. And, um, but, you know, I just to pick up, if I may, on Amit's point, because quite rightly, Cliff, you wanted to steer us towards kind of the levers of systemic change. And for me, that's, you know, that's what's critical and particularly where you can mobilize people, us, because people influence businesses, people influence the politicians who are not never as bold and brave as we want them to be. And Amit mentioned pensions, you know. Three trillion pounds sitting in UK pensions, and as as many as, as as you know here in the UK, very successful new campaign, Make My Money Matter, led by a prominent activist Richard Curtis, challenging, uh, empowering us all, connecting us with our power as as savers with the power we have in those pensions, which we didn't, we don't know because we're never given very much information about what's being invested. It's already starting to have a difference. You know, tomorrow there's going to be a big announcement from. A leading group about their intentions in relation to the pension. One of the leading pension providers will already declared they're going to net net zero. And of course, you ask what makes a difference. It's leadership uh, and leadership by example. And then to Amit's point, in an interconnected world, we can share that leadership. So if if they're doing this here over there, why can't we do it here? And that question gets increasingly uncomfortable uh, for senior decision makers in the boardroom. Or, or around the the, the government uh, table, and you know, I think that's part of the key to this. Fantastic, thank you. We're we're, got, we're very short on time now, so Laurie and then Dolika. Just, just a very quick, just a very quick reinforcement of a couple of points in another example. So levers for for change. I think looking at actors. So these development financial institutions I've mentioned, they're a great lever point for mobilizing more capital. Governments own them. So governments have a medium, they have a channel to frankly change the risk appetite, expand the risk appetite, give them a broader mandate to respond to the COVID era, the COVID recovery we've been talking about in the first part of the conversation. And their participation, the development finance institution's participation in a transaction gives tremendous confidence to private sector investors just their participation alone because of their experience. So I do think we shouldn't ignore that we have a constellation of actors we could potentially dial up their role and activity. Citizen voice, completely agree, make my money matter. Also where we bank, we all have bank accounts that the same principle holds true. This is not the bank's money, it's our money. And so we should be thoughtful about where we want that money to be deposited to do what? To on lend into a local community to actually make a difference in a local community. And the third would be holding our leaders, I completely agree with Nick, to account. And the impact community, I think, has done a terrific job of moving beyond just rhetoric and statements with the work of the GIN, the GSG, and others to say, what's really happening? Let's look at actions and results and not let people sit behind beautiful logos and SDG graphics and pictures. Let's really talk about actions and results. Thank you. Dolika. So, Cliff, I should make it brief and say all of the above. Nick, you stole my make my money matter. I was going to use that because Tony Burden has been so keen on this. So I think fundamentally that's what it is for all of us individually, collectively, 
making sure that our money is making a difference because if it isn't we're not risk managing our own portfolios because this could become a risk that could upend everything in which we say we invest whether it's bilaterally multilaterally uh the the, the business sector if we don't make this work societies are going to implode and that will have an impact on us. It's not about COVID. It's about we'll sorting out issues we'll that have been outstanding for many years. Okay, perfect, perfect. I'm not sure if people are still listening, but if they are, what have we heard? We've heard that it's it wasn't good before. It's a massive challenge now, but some really outstanding responses. Um, with technology, youth, being specific, specific f facilities, making offers and solutions, actions and results. It's system change and cultural change. And most of all, it's leadership. And that's all of us, folks. We are the leaders. We will make it happen. Thank you very much indeed, all the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Whoa.